Good morning, and we begin our program this morning with U.S. Representative Joe Courtney of Connecticut's Second District. That's an area of the state that's seen good job growth re recently. Congressman Courtney joins us from Washington this morning. Congressman, thank you for being with us. I know jobs is something that your office has been touting the progress on. Electric boat obviously having a lot to do with it, but one thing you point out is there's a lot of other things happening in your district. Tell us about that. Sure. So, uh, again, as the calendar year winds down, um, you know, we track this really almost on a weekly basis at the shipyard, and they are now in excess of 5,200 hires between Quonset Point and Groton. Again, two thirds in Connecticut, one third uh, in Rhode Island. So, again, historic number that historic gets thrown a lot. It really is a historic number. And there's uh, a ripple effect in terms of the hundreds of supply chain companies that are also now feeding into uh, the construction of the two submarine programs. And um, uh, again, in, in those facilities, it's like tens of, of new workers as opposed to thousands, but still, um, it, you know, these are good jobs. Manufacturing has a huge uh, multiplier effect in terms of local economies. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's, it's really, um, again, a, a, a an unprecedented time. I mean, even more than World War II, if you go back and look at those numbers that are there. The the challenge, obviously, is that there is this is going to continue, and the number of openings um, still uh, going into 2024 and 2025 will still be at the same numbers, and, we, and we've got to obviously do everything with the trade schools, job training programs, apprenticeship programs, uh, recruitment. I mean, you probably see some of the ads even on, you know, NFL football games in terms of the hiring, which really kind of validates what I'm saying here, that something pretty special is happening. And looking ahead to the future, uh, I know one big thing that happened is this deal uh, with Australian submarines and that that's going to be just like we see in some of the, the, the long term planning for U.S. subs. This is going to be a long term win for the people of your district. Is that right? Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, a couple days ago, uh, the House uh, passed the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Senate uh, did the day before. Um, and again, it included these provisions, which for the first time ever authorized the sale of nuclear powered submarines to another country. Obviously, a great ally, Australia, which has made a huge financial commitment to change their fleet from diesel to nuclear powered. And um, as you point out, this is going to be a, a multi-year process into the early 2030s and beyond. Um, again, it's uh, the, the last time we shared nuclear propulsion technology was 1958 with the United Kingdom. And again, that all sort of centered around uh, the amazing workforce in Groton. So, um, you know, this is going to be a national defense bill that will be long remembered for, for this uh new step forward. And I think you're going to start hearing a lot of Australian accents right in southeastern Connecticut as they, uh, again, try to skill up their own workforce. Well, as you uh, have those kind of deals, which obviously you're celebrating and many people in the district are, it leads to other challenges, things like needing enough housing for people to move into and needing some of those support jobs. So I know housing was something you were talking about recently. Uh, you were in Vernon looking at some brownfield sites, but how much of a challenge is that and what can Washington do to help on a local level with that? Sure. So uh, there's no question that we have a housing shortage. And um, if you look at the cost of rents and the availability of units, um, and the same is even probably more true in terms of uh, you know real estate sales that are out there right now. Uh, again, there are sort of you know longstanding programs that promote uh, construction of uh, more units, and and we see some of that um, in the region, New London in particular. Um, has uh, seen really impressive growth, over a thousand new market rent units, um, as well as, uh, again, affordable housing units that, um, again, are for people, you know, it, it, who are also working uh, families as well. But we need more. I mean, and, and that's certainly the what the HR department at EB uh, constantly tells us, particularly for people coming in from out of state. And, and yes, I said that, we have people coming from out of state into Connecticut, but we, we've got to really ramp up our game to try and um, make sure they've got a place to live, which is, uh, you know, big disincentive if um, it, it just becomes too um, difficult or expensive for them to stay. 
Uh, that, of course, you know, the jobs and, and the things moving towards housing, good news. Some bad news out of your district recently was this report that came out about the Coast Guard Academy. And I know uh, when the first report from Admiral Fagan uh, came out, you said it was a healthy course correction. Then over the last uh, week or so, we heard testimony from uh, some of the women who were affected. And it, I mean, it was a lead on many of the national newscasts coming out of uh, an institution that's in your district. Do you still think healthy course correction is, are we moving just in the right direction or does more even need to be done now that you hear those stories? Sure. I mean, unfortunately, this has been a persistent problem really going back a decade. And, um, you know, we've had House oversight hearings um, over the last few years. There was a really brave, um, you know, Coast Guard officer from New London who came and testified in the House, again, documenting the same type of um, negative, you know, harassment uh, behavior. Uh, what I personally think is that Admiral Fagan did, um, you know, introduce a course correction in terms of really changing, uh, again, a lot of the rules that protect victims of this type of totally unacceptable conduct to, to be able to come forward without really uh, putting their Coast Guard career at risk, which is what we heard this past week in the Senate when, when um, again, these, these folks came forward with just horrible um, stories and and again I, um, I I think there's a going to be more of those hearings and I think the the suppression of the fouled anchor report which uh, again was talked about there uh, that Admiral Fagan actually did release um, never should that that suppression never should have happened that 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 would have I think gotten us further along in this process of providing more protections uh, for people that are there and um, uh, and again I think Admiral Fagan is going to be coming to to pers in person testify soon, but I think when people listen to her, um, they will, I think, note what I uh, just described, which is that um, she is totally committed to changing, not just for the Coast Guard Academy, but for the whole branch in terms of the way, um, you know, these really talented women and new recruits are, are um, going to be treated in the future, that, that that we can't abide that, we can't afford that because the role of the Coast Guard is so important, not just at home, but overseas. Well, certainly we like to say in our business, sunshine is the best disinfectant, a lot of sunshine on that, and we'll continue to follow that story. Uh, we only have a minute left, so I want to talk about some big topics, but very quickly, if you would give me quick answers on these. Uh, Ukraine funding and it being tied to the southern border, uh, do you see any, any movement on that? What's your take on it? Well, uh, again, this week there still was discussions going on in the Senate, which uh, I think everyone agrees is where this this bill is going to have to originate. Um, it is critical, for, in, in actually in both areas, um, that you know we get some movement here. And I am hopeful that we're not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, though, which is really the recipe for delay. Which, particularly right now where Ukraine is, they they cannot afford delay in terms of uh, you know protecting the hard fought gains. Uh, over 2022 and 2023. How about uh, what's happening in Gaza? Uh, is there any update there as far as, uh, you know, things that we, we, you and I talked about it when the attack first happened. Uh, what is the latest from there, from your perspective? So, I mean, we, the seven week pause where we actually saw some hostages released, including, um, you know, a, a family member of someone from Waterford, Connecticut, um, in my opinion, showed that that's you know, that's that type of effort has to continue. Secretary Blinken um, and Jake Sullivan are uh, talking to the Israeli government to try and get them to, into a position where we can reconstruct the, the progress that was made, both in terms of hostage release and also humanitarian aid getting into into Gaza. And um, I, I, again, I think the, the most credible broker right now in terms of trying to pull that off is the United States uh, government. And I um, I think President Biden has already demonstrated by some of his comments, uh, somewhat critical of Israel's conduct uh, after that pause, that um, the U.S. really does stand as the true broker that can negotiate a, a, a more long-lasting pause and, and getting people home to their families. Well, Congressman Joe Courtney, we're all out of time. We appreciate you covering so many topics. We'll have you back again, and uh, thank you for being with us on CT23. Thanks, Eric.